Amen. We believe that, don't we? God will take care of us through every day, all the way. He will take care of us. I want to keep with the theme that we started last week, talking about ministering the way that Jesus ministers. Are we, as a church community, doing ministry and seeking to make disciples based off of what we see in Scripture and exemplified in the life of Jesus? So I want you to turn with me to Matthew this morning. Matthew's Gospel in chapter 19. Now, as you have already seen, demonstrated, and already heard this morning, we are sort of uh, coming off the heels of a great week of Vacation Bible School. And you have all demonstrated and proven to me this week that you know how to receive children. We know how to love children. We know how to open up our arms and love children. But I want to look at this example that Jesus gives us in verses 13 through 15 here in a few moments and ask the question, are we making room for the little children, the little ones? Are we making room for the children? There was a, an Australian uh, author, an essayist, who wrote a story some years ago. His name was Frank Borum. And it was a, a completely imaginary story, okay? So keep in mind, this is just pure imagination speculation. But he, he wrote a story about all of the preborn babies in heaven getting together and sort of holding this council. And, and they were asking a lot of questions before they were delivered into this world about what life was going to be like and what it was like down below. And like all meetings, they soon ran into trouble. Some disturbing rumors had reached Babyland, he says in his story. The children had heard that half of them born into this world would live in poverty and ignorance, that many of them would be killed before even being born, that mothers and fathers of many of the children would not want them and would abuse them. In fact, the babies began to surmise it's a terrible risk to be born into this world. And so they united together and rose in protest. And in this fictional speculative story, they marched against the gates of heaven and said, we don't want to go down there. It's too dangerous. Of course, there is no such council. There is no such gathering. Children don't have a choice. They're born into this world needy and dependent, aren't they? They need us for everything. They count on us to, to feed them and to clothe them. They count on us for, for growth and for sustenance. And while all of us, I think, understand this on a physical or material level, I ask this morning... Do we understand that the same is true spiritually for all of the babies, for all of the children that come into this world? Do we recognize and acknowledge, church, that children are dependent upon us, parents, and upon us, church community, to teach them the gospel? to teach them the word of God, to nurture them in the truth, to live out the truth before them, and to provide that example of Christ-likeness by which they can see the gospel lived out and believe the truth concerning Jesus Christ. We might rethink the imaginary story above and ask the question, would babies want this to be their church if they had a choice? Would children want this to be the church that they were coming into if they had the choice? Now, we look at the example of Jesus this morning and we see him exemplifying what it looks like to receive children. But statistics and research tell us, church, that to a large degree, the evangelical church is losing the battle for the hearts and minds of children today. They are falling far too frequently under other influences. They are not growing up in homes where the gospel and the word of God and, and little things like vacation Bible school are a priority anymore. They're not seeing that in the same numbers that many of us did. In fact, in the early service I asked, you don't have to raise your hand for this, but how many of us grew up attending Bible school? That was just a regular thing. 
I remember going to VBS almost every summer as a little kid at Silver Grove Christian Church. And, and I remember putting money in buckets and wearing the little colored pens and drinking the awful Kool-Aid. Oh, it was, wasn't sweet enough. And now I know why. They didn't want us to have sugar. And we are going to have to have a council meeting here about this whole Jesus juice thing at Williamstown. Those of you who are at Bible school know what I'm talking about. Man, they gave these kids Kool-Aid so full of sugar, it was almost like jello when you poured it. It just <laughs> so much sugar. And, and, of course, the parents had to take the kids home, you know. And Daryl said, oh, that's what we call Jesus juice. And I said, I think it's witch's brew, man. I said, that's awful. But I, I did that growing up. And for one generation that prioritized the things of God and taught their children to do the same, another gener generation that does not prioritize these things will soon have children of their own. And they'll be one generation further removed from prioritizing the things of God, the people of God, the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there's a much larger percentage of kids out there in the world today who are growing up in homes and with families where Jesus is not a priority, where the gospel is not central. What's it going to be like in 20 years when those little kids start having kids? What's it going to be like in 35 or 40 years when they have grandchildren that have never heard of vacation Bible school? The gospel of Jesus? What's that about? Church, we need to be a place that prioritizes and makes room for and opens our arms to the children that God brings us. I'm not saying we don't do that now, but I'm saying we must ever keep before us the importance of this task. And look at Jesus' example in Matthew chapter 19. Now, before I read the whole passage, just look at the first two words, then children. Uh, You've you got to understand what the then is there for. Because everything in verses 13 through 15 takes place in a broader context. And that broader context is found in verses 1 through 12, where Jesus is teaching some heavy things. Right? He's teaching about divorce and remarriage. In chapter 18, just prior to this, he had been answering questions and, and teaching through parables and teaching about sin and, and lost sheep and just following this passage, we find Jesus dealing with a rich young ruler who was seeking eternal life. Now, I point this out because there were all kinds of serious, heavy, important ministry things going on when right in the midst of that, we have presumably parents and others who actively, in verse 13, are bringing their children to Jesus. Notice verse 13, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. Not unusual at all in Middle Eastern culture, not unusual at all in Jewish culture, that parents would want the, the wisdom and the knowledge of the aged to be passed on to their children. They would want that blessing from the older generation to the child. They would want the rabbis to lay their hands on them and pray a blessing over them. And it was important for these parents. They'll wait in line. They'll wait behind others. They'll bring their kids to Jesus in verse 13 so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. But at the end of verse 13 we read, the disciples rebuked the people. Can you imagine what it might have sounded like? Je Jesus doesn't have time for this. Get those snot-nosed kids out of here. Why, that one's filthy. Don't let him climb up on the master. And, and that, one, that one's got a, a sticky hands from eating a sucker. Don't let him climb up in Jesus' lap. Parents, we don't have time for all this. The master's got important things to do. Now, that's purely speculation. We don't know what they said. But they started turning people away. They started rebuking the multitudes. And verse 14 tells us, as a word of correction, that Jesus turns to the disciples. And in contradiction to what they were doing, he says, no, let the little children come to me. We've heard that so many times that it may have lost its intensity. Jesus corrects his disciples and says, let them come. Let them climb up in my lap. Let them throw their arms around me. 
And then for emphasis, he states it in the negative and says, don't turn them away. So there's a positive aspect to this. Bring them, let them come, bring them on. And there's a negative aspect that says, do not turn them away. Don't hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Verse 15, and he laid his hands on them and went away. Now the passage can be broken down easily by noting a couple of key movements. In the first part of verse 13, there is what we'll call the bringing of the children. We'll discuss that more in a moment. And in the latter part of verse 13, there is the rejection of the children. So write down these words, bringing and rejection. And then we're going to see Jesus in verses 14 and 15, inviting them and blessing them. So there's bringing, rejection, invitation, and blessing. And I want to talk around those four words today about what it means to be a church that makes room for the children. We see parents bringing their children into the presence of Jesus because they expected that in his presence they would be blessed. I'm going to approach this idea of bringing your children from two angles this morning. Uh, the first one, let me ask you who are parents or grandparents or caregivers of any sort. L let me start by addressing you and saying, do you make it a priority to bring your children and grandchildren into the presence of God's house and into the midst of God's people and into the midst of the gathered church because you are expecting them to be blessed when they come into the midst of God's people? Now, here's what I'm not saying, and don't hear me saying this. I'm not saying that church is the only place where your kids can learn about Jesus. In fact, I don't believe that at all. I think, and, and, and I'll tell you in here in a moment, I think the Bible is very clear that it has to begin at home first. And everything we do as a gathered church should be a supplement, should be an addition to the spiritual nurturing that kids are getting at home. But there's something to be said for prioritizing church in the life of your children. Do you? And if not, if it's not a priority for you to have your children, your grandchildren, your, your nieces, your nephews, if it's not a priority to have them here, then we have to pause and ask the question, why not? See, there are lots of things that we make priorities for our children today, aren't there? We live in a culture that prioritizes sports and extracurricular activities and, and various academic pursuits and various awards. And, and, and I'm not saying any of those things are bad or that you shouldn't be involved in them. I don't believe that. I'm a big fan of sports. Big fan of hobbies and, and extracurricular activities. But Christians have to be reminded from time to time that the most important priority that we have is the spiritual nurturing and upbringing of our children. Everything else is secondary to that, right? My kids can, can survive if they're not incredible athletes or they can survive if they're not incredible at some hobby or some, uh, some pursuit, but they, they can't survive without the life that comes through Jesus Christ. They've got to have that spiritual foundation. That has to be first and foremost the priority. And we have at least one example from Scripture of what that prioritization looked like in the life of a disciple. While you're holding your place in Matthew 19, because we will come back, look over in 2 Timothy for a moment. What does it look like when moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles prioritize the Word of God and the Gospel of Christ and, and, and make it an important priority to bring their children around the people of God, what does it look like? Well, Paul's writing his second letter to young Timothy when he says in chapter 1 and verse 5 that he is reminded of Timothy's sincere faith. Sincere faith. It was real wasn't pretend, he wasn't putting on a show, right? He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. We don't know where Timothy's dad was at in this process, but we know that he had a godly mother and grandmother who stepped up to the plate and prioritized the things of God. And, and, and brought Timothy, whenever there was a, a Bible study or whenever the law of Moses was opened up for discussion, they made sure that young Timothy was there. 
And turn the page over to chapter 3 of the same book. Just a page or so across. And look in verse 15. Paul acknowledges about Timothy that from his childhood, he was acquainted with the sacred writings. That's the Old Testament. That's the scriptures. From your childhood, you've been acquainted with these sacred writings. And notice this. These sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He goes on to establish the, the infallibility and the perfection and the inspiration and the authority of the scriptures in verse 16. But he first points out to Timothy, it was a knowledge of the scriptures that led to you finding salvation in Jesus Christ. This is what it looks like when parents make a priority of bringing their kids into the presence of Jesus Christ. Now let me say this. Bringing your child to church or to children's programs or to VBS or Awanas, none of those things will guarantee that your child is going to be a Christian, right? Ultimately, it will still be an individual decision that your children make when they reach a certain age of understanding and accountability. However, we can fill their hearts and minds with a knowledge of the right information. So that when the time comes for them to make the right choice concerning Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they will have the right information. If we're not filling their hearts and their heads with a knowledge of who Jesus is, trust me when I say this, there are plenty of other influences in the world that want to take that role and fill them with all sorts of knowledge and influence. There's no guarantee that they will be Christians just because you brought them to church. Many a parent comes to me and says, Pastor, go visit with my son or my daughter. I, I just, I don't know what's wrong with them. I brought them to church my whole life and now they've just gone off this other direction. I can't guarantee that your child will become a Christian by being here. But I can guarantee that they'll receive the right information. They'll receive the teaching of the Word of God. They'll receive the love of God's people. They'll be taught how to praise and how to give and how to serve so that they've got the right information to draw upon. They're getting the influence from somewhere. Let's make it from the church, the people of God. I've heard older preachers say that when they were growing up, they had a drug problem. And that drug problem was that their mama drugged them to church every time the doors were open. You heard that before? That wouldn't be such a bad problem for your child to grow up with. Amen? Because someday in due time, they'll look back and say, my mom cared enough. My dad cared enough. My mamma, my papa cared enough that every time there was a children's choir, or every time there was a youth meeting or an Awanas or a vacation Bible school, that was the priority for our family. Are we prioritizing the things that matter most? Let me say secondly about this idea of bringing. I want to turn this around a little bit and ask the church at large, are we creating the kind of culture here? Are we doing ministry and loving kids in such a way that families in our community know and feel comfortable bringing their kids here and dropping them off and turning them over to us? Now, I don't ever think it's the best plan, but that's a reality, isn't it? That for some parents, they just want some place for their kids to go. Are we going to be that place? Are we going to cultivate that kind of culture here that says, following the example of Jesus, bring your kids to us. We love them. We want them. As I said Friday night, we want them dirty feet and all, boogers and all, sucker sticks and all. Bring them to us, we'll take them, and, and, and we'll be grateful to God that we have them. Because church, there are far too many sanctuaries today that are missing this, these kids, this vacation Bible school. They're missing this. And it's one of those things you don't realize how much you value it and how important it is until you look out one Sunday and you see there's nobody here under the age of 40. Where'd all of our kids go? Let's be that kind of place. Look, though, at the latter part of verse 13. That's the, the bringing aspect. Let me talk for a moment about the rejection. The disciples in verse 13, in their, in their ignorance, didn't make room for the children. They even turned them away. 
rebuking the parents, turning them out. And Jesus witnessed this and turns and corrects them and says, you guys are wrong for turning away these families and these children. It's as if Jesus is reminding his disciples, nothing I do is so important that I don't have time for these. Nothing I'm doing ministerially is so important, Jesus says, that I can't take the time to wrap my arms around these kids and love them and bless them. There are very few places anymore that make room for children. Many homes don't make room for children today. In many homes, children are no longer taught the gospel. They're no longer taught the word of God. They're no longer taught uh, uh, the 12 disciples and the Lord's Prayer and all of those basics that many of us grew up with or, or know by heart. And not only are they not taught the right things, but in, in their place, their, their hearts and their minds are filled with all sorts of, of negative influences. The same kids who are not being taught the gospel at home are in many cases growing up in broken homes. They're seeing abuse, physical. They're seeing substance abuse. They're seeing marriages fall apart. And so they're not getting at home all of the good spiritual foundations. And instead, in many cases, they're being exposed to all of the things that Satan will use to tear them apart. Deuteronomy chapter 6 makes very clear that in the mind of God, that teaching our children spiritual truths first begins at home. But some homes don't make room for Jesus anymore. We live in a culture that, that doesn't make room for children anymore, right? There's no time for childhood these days. Kids are too active, they're involved, they're caught up in programs. There's no time to just be a kid anymore and, and you know, run around all summer with your shoes off, playing in the creek and splashing in the mud. I mean, those days are gone. Kids are busy now, they're in programs, they've got summer programs, they've got camps, they've got, and sometimes I think we're, we're making them grow up too quickly. We're not giving them room to be kids and to, to explore who Christ is. But the saddest thing is when churches don't make room for children. If we're not careful, we will tend to take on the spirit of the disciples in this passage where we get so concerned about ministry that we forget about people. Now, just like Jesus in his ministry, he had to address some serious stuff. He was teaching some important things. He, he had real important matters at hand. Sometimes in church life, we have to deal with important things, don't we? We help feed the hungry. We help take care of the poor. We help reach out to people in our community. Our, our deacons are serving our, our, our elderly and visiting our shut-ins. And we've got budgets and we've got committee meetings and we've got hard decisions to make. And I know that those things are a reality in church life. But God help us to never get so busy doing the stuff of ministry that we forget about the people that God sends our way. We forget that the real reason we exist is connecting with those little kids. Barefoot, dirty feet, snotty noses, sticky hands. Let's never forget they're the reason God put us right here where we are in the middle of Williamstown where there's needs all around us and kids all around us who need to be received by a church who will love them and teach them about Christ. Church, we have to work hard to create a culture within our own individual homes and also within our church community. We have to work hard to create a culture where we're not turning away kids, but we are receiving them. And here's the example of Jesus in verse 14. Here's the invitation aspect. He doesn't want them turned away, does he? Just like last week in chapter 9, he didn't turn away from the brokenness. And he didn't just stand there and curse the darkness. No. He opens his arms and receives these children and warns the disciples against turning them away and then even adds at the end of verse 14, maybe we have something to learn from them, right? Notice how he says at the end of verse 14, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. 
He's not talking here about young children um, before the age of accountability. or, or any, He's not talking about anything like that. He's not talking about their immediate salvation, universal salvation. No. What he's doing is he's pointing to children and saying to the disciples, if you could learn the simplicity of obedience and faith and childlike trust and humility, if you could learn the simplicity of these things the way that these children have learned them, you might learn something about the kingdom of heaven. Children didn't stop and ask a bunch of questions. They didn't interview Jesus first. They didn't come to him as skeptics. They didn't come to him with all kinds of, of questions on their mind. They didn't want answers. They simply run to Jesus, throw their arms around him, and receive the blessing that he has to give. Great humility, great simplicity, great faith on their part. And Jesus says to the disciples, this is what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Obedience, trust, love, humility. Some of you here today may not know Christ as Lord and Savior. And you may have all sorts of objections and all sorts of questions and, and all sorts of, of critiques of, of Bible teaching and the gospel and you've let those things stand between you and a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think the Spirit of God is pointing to these children today and saying to you, the simplicity of childlike faith, the simplicity of childlike trust, the humility of these children has something to teach us. Don't turn them away. No. Receive them. Learn from them. Learn about simple faith. Come to me and receive a blessing which he gives them in verse 15. Lays his hands on them. Takes time out of his busy schedule. Thank you, Lord, to acknowledge these children and to bless them. Church, do we want to be a place where not only everyone, but specifically where children and youth can come and meet Jesus and have their lives changed? Do we want to be the kind of place where they can come and encounter Christ and be received and be blessed and, and leave here different than they came? I think we do. I'm going to close by putting on the screen behind me a couple of very practical tips. These are not mine. These are taken from an article in Ministry Today magazine called The Five Pillars of Children's Ministry. And there's a little acronym for those of you who like to take notes and, and those of you who work with children. You may want to write down this word fresh. The author, Julie Beter, calls this a fresh approach to children's ministry. And she reminds us that if we're going to be a church that ministers to children the way Jesus ministers to children, then we've got to remember a few things. She says, for example, that the F stands for fun. I know that sounds silly, but don't overlook the importance of kids having fun when they come here. We don't have to compromise the truth of the gospel. We don't have to water down the biblical truths concerning sin and salvation in Christ. But man, we can make it fun for kids, and we did this week. Because when kids come and have fun, they want to come back. The evidence I saw in my own children this week who wanted to be here for Bible school because they had such a good time. She tells us that the R is for relationship or making children's ministry relational. Every time we look around and see young children in here, we should be reminded of their great need to have healthy, positive relationships. Some of them don't have grandparents. Some of them don't have fathers. Some of them are in single parent homes. And, and you may be the one that they're looking to for an appropriate hug or for some good advice, for some wisdom. We've got to take time to be relational to the children that God sends our way. The E is for energetic. And mark my word, if we open up our arms to receive the children of our community, we're going to find out they're full of a lot of energy, right? And they break things. And they spill Kool-Aid on the floor. And they leave sucker sticks and candy wrappers in their wake. But guess what? So did every one of you. And you survived it. And you're here today. As evidence of God's mercy and grace that you did survive those childhood years. 
When God sends his kids, let's remember they're full of energy, they're full of joy, they're full of excitement. The S is for safety. Let's make it a priority church. And this has a lot to do with, with background checks and with making sure we have a lot of chaperones and all. Let's make this a safe place where kids feel welcome, where they know and where their parents know that they're going to be taken care of and loved on. And the H is just for helpful. And, and what she means by this in the article is, we have the opportunity to mentor and to teach and to provide guidance to children who may not be getting moral and ethical direction from anywhere else. Folks, we have God's word that we believe is true. And it not only points us to eternal life in Jesus Christ alone, but it also points us to how we should live, how we should make decisions, how we should treat others, how we live out the gospel as spirit-filled people. And a lot of the kids that God sends our way, they don't have those answers yet. But you might be the helpful guide that steers them in that direction. So I ask you as we close this morning, church, do we want to be this kind of place? Will we make room for the children? Do we want to be the kind of church that receives kids the way Jesus did? Because if we say yes to that, look out. God might just send them our way. We have a mission field right here in front of us if we will open our eyes to see it. Our fields are truly white unto harvest. Church, will we make room for our children? This morning you may say, you know what, Pastor? That energizes me to want to commit my life or recommit my life to following Christ and serving Him better in this church. Someone may be here visiting and say, you know what, Pastor, if that's the kind of church Williamstown is, that's the kind of church I want to invest my life in. I want my family to be here at Williamstown Baptist Church. But some others may have heard this message this morning and said, you know, that part about simple childlike faith, that's what I need to hear. I need to talk to someone about what it means to know Christ, to follow Christ, and to trust Him. Because there's barriers in my life, Pastor. That's okay. That's all right. If you have the courage to step out this morning and say, I want to know what the Bible says about following Christ, we'll stay after church and we'll talk to you. We'll show you from the Word of God. We'll try to answer all your questions. We'll pray with you. We'll point you to the cross of Christ because that is our only hope for forgiveness and eternal life. I don't know what decision you need to make today, but as our musicians come and as we pray together, if God is speaking to your hearts, step out as we sing this morning and come. Bow with me, Father. We need you today. We need you to impress upon our hearts the urgency of the task before us to make room for the children that you send our way. Lord, make this a defining characteristic of who we are at Williamstown Baptist Church. We want to be a church that throws our arms open wide and receives all, and especially all the children that you bless us with and send our way. Now, Lord, we have had a great week of ministry, and we have celebrated that today, and I thank you for all that we have seen, for all of the leadership, for all of the service. Lord, make that a template, a model for us as a church as we press ahead through this summer and in the months to come. Send the children our way so that we may see you change a generation by transforming them with the gospel. And speak to us here who are not children. Speak to us here this morning, maybe about the commitment of our lives or the lack of commitment in our lives. Someone here may need to rededicate themselves today to service, confessing sin or uniting with a church family. Speak to them, Lord, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning as we sing.